Part One. You will hear a student and an advisor talking about facilities at a college. First, you have some time to look at questions one to five. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully, and answer questions one to five. Hi, I wonder if you could help me. I'm starting a course at Glenfield in a few weeks. I was just a bit worried about what facilities there will be, and what I'll have to do. I'm especially interested in health and welfare stuff. Certainly, we normally send out a copy of our leaflet, "Staying Healthy at Glenfield." I'm not sure why you haven't had it. Well, could you answer a few questions for me? Firstly, I'm wondering about how I get a doctor when I arrive. Well, you can register with the University Health Centre on North Campus. And do I have to pay for that? Not to register, but if you have to get medicines, there's a prescription charge of six pounds fifty. Okay. Well, I'm not planning to get ill. That's only going to arise if I have any problems. So, should I just go along when I arrive? That's what we recommend for peace of mind. But it's not compulsory. And if you don't live inside the catchment area, you can't, in fact, register there. Where do you live? Well, at the moment, I'm staying at the Backpackers Hostel in Hill Street. But I will be moving from there shortly, somewhere nearer. Well, there's a map at the centre which shows you the area that the university practice can accept people from. It's what we call the yellow zone. If you live outside that area, you have to find another medical centre to register with. It sounds like I'll only qualify after I move. I think you might be right. Then, in addition to the health centre, there's a free counselling service for all students situated on the north campus. You don't have to register. They also have drop-in sessions. I say it's free, but that's only for up to eight sessions. Beyond that, they normally refer people elsewhere. Sounds serious. Well, it's not just for big problems. People go there for advice on housing, workload, whatever. Really, they can even arrange financial help.、Hmm. Uh, is it confidential? Absolutely. Then again, a lot of students prefer to phone the Nightline service, which is run from an office on the central campus. They don't really encourage people to drop in. I see. So it's basically a free phone line. The number, if you want to make a note, is o nine hundred seven six two five nine one three. I'll say it again: o nine hundred seven six two five nine one three. Fine. Well, I hope I won't need any of these. What I will want is access to some gym facilities. Right. Well, you'll find those on the south campus in the sports centre. It's great, but it's not free. You have to present your student card and pay a fee of twenty-two pounds to get a pass. But that will last you for the whole year. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions six to ten. Now listen and answer questions six to ten. Is this information on the website? I'm afraid not. I can send you some leaflets, or even resend the whole information pack if you give me your details. Uh, could you send the whole information pack, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll have to take down some details. Could you tell me your full name? Sonia Orr. S O. N Y. Uh, no. I'll spell it. S O N I A. Then, or is O R R. Or. Okay. 
And you said you were on Hills Road? Yes, but don't send it there as I'm about to move. I'll give you my new address, which is 22 Winter Gardens. That's Glenfield. And the postcode? Oh, yeah. That's GF23 9BQ. Fine. Now, we're doing a bit of data collection about who uses our services at the moment. Can I just ask a few more questions? Yes, that's fine. OK. If you're an international student, what country are you from? I'm from Switzerland. And how old are you? I'm 24. And finally, which course are you enrolled on? Right. Well, that's a bit complicated, since I'm hoping to switch to economics and history. But at the moment... I'm down to do economics and sociology. It's a joint degree. OK, I'll put that. Great. Well, I'll pop the information pack in the post and you should get it soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a trainer giving a talk to people who want to learn outdoor survival skills. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 16. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our outdoor survival program. As you know, this week you'll be learning some of the basic information and skills you need to look after yourself independently in the outdoors. These first two days, we'll be based here in the classroom and then we'll be taking a camping trip to put into practice some of the things you've learned. I'm going to start off with the topic of food. And to start with, I'll describe just two methods which we'll be putting into practice at our camp and which make use of natural resources, the steam pit and the bamboo pot. I've got two posters here to make things clearer, and I'll start with the steam pit here. To make this, you'll need some dry sticks, some grass, some loose earth, and some stones. And for this week only, some matches. <laughs> the first thing you do is to dig a shallow pit in the place you've chosen to do your cooking. Let's say about 25 centimeters deep and 30 centimeters wide. Your sticks have to be a bit wider than the pit because you have to put a line of them along the top from one end of the pit to the other. Before setting light to these, you take some large stones and arrange them on top. Then you start the fire and wait till the wooden platform burns through and the stones fall into the pit. At this point, brush away any pieces of hot ash from the stones. You can use a handful of grass and then take another stick and push it down into the center of the pit, between the stones. After that, you cover the whole pit with a thick layer of grass. And then you can put your food on it, wrapped in more pieces of grass, like parcels. Finally, cover the whole thing with earth. You have to pat it firmly to seal the pit. Then all you have to do is take the stick out and pour a bit of water into the opening that it leaves. It should take about four hours for your food to cook, 
as it cooks slowly in the steam that's created inside the pit. Now you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. So, simple but effective. The other method you're going to practice this week is the bamboo oven. Now the steam pit is ideal in certain conditions because the heat is below ground level. For example, if there's a strong wind and you're afraid a fire might spread. But when it's safe to have an open fire, you can use the bamboo oven method. You get a length of bamboo, which, as you probably know, is hollow and consists of a number of individual sections with a wall in between. You use a sharp stick to make a hole in each of the dividing walls apart from the end one. Then you lean the bamboo over a fire with the top propped up by a forked stick and the bottom sitting on the ground. You pour enough water in the top to fill the bottom section and then light a fire underneath that section to heat the water. Then you put your food inside the top section and the steam coming up the bamboo through the holes you made cooks it. I'm going to move on now to food itself and talk about some of the wild plants you might cook. I'm going to begin with fungi. That's mushrooms and toads. I'm sure you'll be aware that some of these are edible and they're delicious, but some of them are highly poisonous. Now, whether they're poisonous or not, all fungi that you find in the wild should be cooked before eating because that helps to destroy any compounds in them that might be mildly toxic. But be aware that any amount of cooking won't make poisonous varieties any safer to eat. Unless you can definitely identify a fungus, you should never eat it. It's not worth the risk. And you need to be really sure, because some fungi that are poisonous are very similar in appearance to certain edible varieties. They can easily be mistaken for each other. So, having said all that, fungi are delicious when they're freshly picked, and although they are only moderately nutritious, they do contain minerals which the body needs. I'll move on now to leafy plants, which are generally... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. Mr. Jackson, who feels that he is physically unfit, is consulting with his doctor about his health condition. Before you listen to their conversation, you have a chance to read questions 21 to 24. Now please listen to the recording and answer questions 21 to 24. Well, Mr Jackson, the first and important thing I have to tell you is that um, there is really nothing seriously wrong with you. Physically, that is. My, uh, my very thorough re-examination and the, the analyst report show that basically you are very fit. Yes, very fit. So, why is it, Doctor that I'm always so nervy, tense, ready to jump on anybody, my wife, children, colleagues. 
I think um, I think your condition has a lot to do with、um, shall we call it way of life habits. Way of life habits. Yes. Now tell me, Mister Jackson, you smoke, don't you? Yes, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I do, Doctor. And、uh, rather heavily, I imagine. Well, yes, I smoke what about forty, fifty a day, I suppose. You should do your best to stop, you know. Yes, I see. But uh, well, it won't be the first time. I've tried to give up smoking several times, but it's it's no good. You see, fifty a day is overdoing it. You must admit, you must cut down at least that. Oh yes, I know that when you're feeling tense, you you, you probably feel that a cigarette relaxes you. But in the long run, I do advise you to make, to make a real effort to quit smoking. Of course, but well, it's easy to say give it up or cut it down, but oh, you know. Well, in my opinion, you have no choice. Either you make a real effort, or or there's no real chance of your feeling better. You see, well, obviously, I could prescribe some kind of tranquilizer, but would that help? I'd prefer, and I'm quite sure you'll agree, I'd prefer to see you really back to normal, not just seemingly so. And that's my reason for asking you several more questions about about your other habits. Right. Now you have a chance to read questions twenty-five to thirty. As you listen to more of their conversation, answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Your eating habits, for example. What do you eat normally during a normal day? Yes, well, I'm a good eater. Yes, I'd say I'm a good eater. Now let's see. Up at eight in the morning, and my wife has a good breakfast ready. A good breakfast. The usual. A cereal followed by bacon and eggs with fried bread and perhaps a tomato or two, then toast and marmalade, all washed down with a couple of cups of tea. I uh yes, I really enjoy my breakfast. Uh yes, I can see you do, but I'd advise you to eat rather less. We'll come to that later. Go on. Then lunch, no first brunch, a cup of coffee and a bun at eleven. Lunch has to be quick because there's so much to do in the office about that time. So I have a pint and a sandwich in the pub, all very hurried. Try to be in less of a hurry. But I make up for it in the evening. I get home at about seven. Dinner's around about eight. Uh, yes, my wife's an excellent cook. Excellent. It's usually some meat dish, and we like spaghetti as a first course. Spaghetti, a meat dish, cheese, sweet, but、uh, but then at the end of the day, shall we say, then well then I begin to feel on edge again. Most evenings after dinner we read or watch TV, but I I get this terrible feeling of tension. Well, I'm sorry to have to say this because you obviously enjoy your food, but、um, I really do recommend. That you, that you eat less, and secondly, that you eat more healthily. Instead of having that enormous breakfast, for example,、um, well, try to be content with fruit juice and some cereal. I see, but、uh... eleven says right. Well, that's all right, but lunch should be more leisurely. Remember, your health is at stake, not your job. As for dinner,、um, I'd advise you to eat a soup, perhaps with a salad, a salad followed by some fruit. But my wife's cooking is superb, granted, and she probably enjoys preparing delicious meals for you. If you like, well,、um, I'll have a word with your wife. No, that won't be necessary.、Uh, thanks, just the same, doctor. But no.
That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up with Frost. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning. This is Jane Frost with this morning's edition of Wake Up with Frost. As you all know, for the last week we've been running a survey trying to find out what you, the listeners, think is the greatest invention of the last two hundred years. The response has been amazing, double the amount we had last year. So thanks to all of you for taking part. We've had about two thousand responses online, and about the same on our phone lines. The lines are now closed, and this morning I can announce what the results were. So here it is: you, the listeners, have chosen as the greatest technological invention of the past two hundred years. And let me not forget to mention that sixty-five percent of you voted for this. It's the bicycle. Yes, the bicycle, first invented in eighteen eighteen, and would you believe it, the first bicycle was made of wood. The second bicycle had iron wheels. I cannot imagine what that must have been like to ride. It would have kept you fit at any rate. But for me, the best thing about the bicycle was what it did for women's rights. Yes, in the eighteen nineties, it was the bicycle that meant women could change their clothing, start wearing trousers or pantaloons, as they were known. Before then, women's clothes had been really uncomfortable, and I'd imagine quite difficult to breathe in. So, thanks to the ordinary bicycle, it was not only the man who wore the trousers in a home. Instead, women could now feel far more equal to their male contemporaries, and I'm sure you'll agree. The bicycle is a great way to get regular exercise, and of course, it's much better for the environment. And today, over one billion people all over the world ride bicycles, and for some, it's their only means of getting around from A to B. So, to all you bicycle riders out there, keep up the good work. Coming in a close second with forty-two percent is the computer. I found out something interesting about the computer, which is that really, this word first meant someone who did mathematical calculations. Of course, today, with the development of the personal computer, computers are being used for everything from home use to business and even digital photography. I don't know about you, but I can't imagine life without a computer now. I guess closely related to the computer is the internet. And this got twelve percent of your votes. Maybe, like myself, many of you might think of the internet as being the World Wide Web, but actually, the web is only one part of the internet. The internet began as part of the United States military network, but it later began to be used by businesses and academic institutions. Of course, today the internet has so many uses. We use it for shopping online and entertainment, as well as to find information and send emails. But sadly, there is a darker side to the internet, and some of you have sent me emails about this. Finally, with five percent of your votes, is the radio. 
We think the radio was invented by Marconi in 1896, and he opened his first radio or wireless factory in the United Kingdom in 1898. In 1906, a man called Reginald Fessenden gave the first radio broadcast from Massachusetts. Ships could hear him at sea, and apparently he played the violin. As yet, listeners, I've spared you from having to listen to my guitar playing. But certainly radio is still important. Let's not forget that it was by radio that the Titanic sent signals to other ships. And with the popularity of TV today, I was secretly pleased so many of you had still placed importance on the radio. So there you have it, the results of our survey. I think there are still important inventions that were not chosen but deserve a mention. Nuclear power and, of course, communications satellite, something which I am certain will continue to change the face of how we communicate with each other over both long and short distances. In fact, for me, the mobile phone is one of the greatest inventions of the last 200 years, if I think back to my first phone and then I look at what is happening now. Children born today will probably be more likely to have their first experience of the Internet on a mobile phone screen rather than a computer monitor. Some of the new mobiles that are now being sold make it just as easy and as quick to find information on the web as on a computer. And let's not forget that mobiles now have digital cameras, word processing facilities, so you can type all your documents and even personal organisers. I think it's quite possible that the mobile may even replace computers one day. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.